All right, look, thank you very much, uh, everybody. I wonder if you'd mind uh, taking your seats at um, one or another of the, uh, of, of, of the tables. Um, my name's Toby Potter, I, I, I know most of you, um, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to, um, to see you here again um, today at a time in the advice profession which is really um, tr transformative. Um, what we've tried to do in setting up today's program is to address the issues that really uh, confront running an advice business and being an advice professional. Um, and I'm going to leave it to Rick de Cristoforo, our AMC, to, to talk about the session. But before I do hand over to Rick, there are a couple of things which I um, wanted to, um, to talk to you about. Um, uh, with IMAP and the things which we have coming up, some of you will have heard me say probably several times that uh, in our view there are four components of a managed account, advice, investment management, technology and the legal structures. And today we're primarily focused on advice, being an advice professional, running an advice business and confronting the challenges that advice uh, faces um, in this climate. But through the, through the course of the year, each year, we run this conference series in March. We run uh, portfolio management, investment-focused conferences um, in the middle of the year. And at the end of the year, we run Investec, which is the, the technology forward-facing conference. This year, we're splitting the portfolio management conference into two parts. In August, in Sydney, we're going to look at portfolio construction, asset allocation, manager selection, the, if you like, the high order, higher order issues that face um, uh, investment committees and portfolio managers of managed account programs. And then in October in uh, Melbourne, we'll be looking at um, the more detailed issues uh, around security selection, Australian equities, international equities, and, and particularly for me, um, fixed income investments and the way in which those are becoming part of um, uh, managed account programs. So there's that, but I also wanted to talk a little about um, the awards. Last year, for the first time, we, um, we ran the managed account awards, um, and this year we're doing it again based on the lessons that we've, that we've learned with a, with a panel of uh, more or less independent judges. We can't use that word independent anymore as as you can't, but, uh, but uh, j judges with disclosed conflicts. Um, uh, focused on the five asset classes that we look at, Australian equities, small caps, fixed interest, multi-asset, and, uh, and international. Um, but also the other two, which are particular interest to me, the licensee award, um, which really is about um, the managed account program we run and how it fits into our advice philosophy and how the two are integrated. So um, we're lucky enough today to have Stanford Brown, who were last year's la licensee um, award winners um, uh, on one of the panels. Um, and the other, the other category is innovation, which is really a, br a wide open, uh, a wide open uh, category. It invites you to say, this is an innovative thing we are doing in our business. Might be technology, might be process, might be some combination of that. Um, which advances the way managed accounts work in Australia. So I'd invite you, uh, I'll say a little more about the awards and the timings uh, later on in the morning. So um, <clears throat> these are the, this is the sort of snapshot and the details about the Portfolio Management Conference. But the other thing I wanted to talk about is the FUM census, which IMAP does. So each six months, uh, we collect the FUM data for managed accounts. Um, it's a pretty um, diverse set of, um, of uh, portfolios that we try and gather data on. Um, uh, many of you participate in that and we thank you for that. Uh, we, break, we break the classification of managed accounts into three categories, the SMA or, M or, or MIS version. So these are registered managed investment schemes. So typically these are the platform-based managed accounts. So the Macquarie's, uh, the NetWealth, the Premiums, the people who are running 
registered managed investment schemes. The MDA version, so these are retail or wholesale that are run in accordance with the class order or legislative instrument. Um, others, there's always another. Um, others, is, uh, others is those which don't fit into either MDA or, or SMA. Now, so what happened in, in the six months to December? Um, well, two things, it seems to me, explain the, the plateauing of managed accounts. So firstly, markets turned down. And when you've got a $60 billion um, pool of assets, the downturn in December took away $6 billion. Um, so that's, the, that's a big kind of market-related issue. But the other, I think, um, uh, issue is the, the uncertainty which existed through the second half of the year as the Royal Commission was, was in full swing. So by December, remembering these were 30, well, these were December, this is December data, uh, by December we were all thinking what will the Royal Commission say? What will they say about vertical integration? Will there be structural separation between advice and product manufacture? And to my mind, um, recalling the conversations I had at the time, um, quite a number of advice businesses said, let's just see how this all plays out. Um, and I think that that was a significant issue because the conversations that I've had since the 1st of February, both with advice businesses and with the, the providers, suggest to me that, uh, that we now have a sort of the wind in our sails. Apart from anything else, we've got back the six billion that we lost and a bit more um, in terms of market returns. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be sending out a press release um, about this data, um, uh, well, Tan, in, uh, in the next 30 minutes. Um, so um, so that's, that's what's happening in the, in the managed account market at the moment. Second half of last year, a plateauing in growth. Um, think of it this way, the inflows actually compensated for um, a pretty significant market downturn. Um, but I feel that when we get to June 2019, uh, yeah, June 2019, we'll see a good deal of this um, come back. Now, so thank you very much. It's uh, now my pleasure to introduce um, Rick De Cristoforo, the MC for the day. Rick, please. Thank you, Toby, and thanks for attending the Institute of Managed Accounts Conference. Uh, it's great to see many familiar faces and ex-colleagues, and for those who don't know me, I'm Rick De Cristoforo. I've been working in the advice platform and managed account space for well over 20 years, having worked in product development at Osmac. I was managing director of Matrix Planning Solutions, led Colonial First States distribution of first choice and first wrap teams, and worked on the Together program, worked in CBA wealth and advice strategy projects and change, and I'm currently a director with KPMG. So enough about me. I'd like us to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land we meet on today, the Gadigal people of the Eroa Nation and their ancestors past and present. Well, what a year. This time last year, we knew a Royal Commission was looming, and I think none of us but the most naive would have believed the industry was going to get through the findings and final report unscathed. We'll probably forever consider the period before the 4th of February 2019 as the pre-Royal Commission world, and since then, we're now in the post-Royal Commission world. And when Toby and I were discussing and planning this conference, we realised that this, this conference is probably the first or one of the first, first after the final report. We decided the content and tone should be aimed higher than subjects solely related to delivering advice relating to managed accounts. And we're therefore asking our presenters to avoid the temptation to use today as a shameless marketing opportunity, extend the discussion to broader matters beyond managed accounts, provide all of us with takeaways about things we can think about and action in our own businesses, and importantly, to take questions and stay to the agenda timing. The fact is, whilst the Royal Commission report did not recommend structural change or an unwinding of vertical integration, as people were presuming, the outcomes, not of the report itself, while significant, but the winds of change from the process, there is little doubt that the government, whoever may be in the latter part of the year, will enact most, if not all, of the recommendations. With that in mind, and to get everyone on the same page, a few key recommendations most relevant to us. 
In advice, the recommendations are an extension of FOFA. Opt-in will become an annual process. And importantly for the entire value chain and revenue chain of the industry, grandfather commissions and other conflicted remuneration pa payments will be wound up. With the process beginning as early as the 1st of July, and in fact some are moving now, and completing no later than 2021. Independent ownership will be brought to the fore, life insurance commission caps will be further reduced, and the disciplinary regime relating to advice will be centralised. The mortgage broking industry is at some point going to experience its own version of FOFA, with the implementation of client best interest rules and the wholesale windback of commissions over time. And that matters to those in the advice industry because many of the businesses here have close relationships with those broking businesses, and those broking businesses can learn from our experience. Trustees of super funds will be required to solely focus on their responsibilities to the fund. Payments for advice fees will not able to be charged on my super accounts. Employees will have a single default fund, which has massive implications for those advice businesses who make rollover and consolidation a big part of their revenue stream. And the banking executive accountability regime will also apply to super fund entities. Financial services businesses across the board will be required to review their remuneration structures annually and governance and culture regularly, particularly for client-facing staff. Non-administrative infringements will be treated by ASIC more as an opportunity to prosecute than issue an EU. ASIC and APRA will have their own oversight entity reviewing their performance and there'll be an industry-funded compensation scheme. So there's a lot of recommendations. What can we do to meet the challenges and opportunities? Well, for one thing, if businesses in the financial services industry don't make significant proactive changes to meet community expectations and build the trust that has been so badly damaged through the revelations, the future is bleak indeed. I hope you, as I am, want to be part of a new future and are much more positive than that. So let's assume that all of us in the room are intent on building a profession that the community will trust and importantly deliver services that clients will value and pay for. Today is aimed at being a small part of your toolkit to build that future. Our first session of the day is entitled in Innovation, Why It's More Important Than Ever. Andrew Braun of Net Wealth will take participants through a discussion on innovation. He'll discuss the need to continually innovate, that business innovation does not have to be delivered in a bing bang, but through a series of continual improvement steps. He'll talk through how you can help yourself in a disrupted market and what to think about when considering threats and opportunities. Andrew will also show us the Swinburne University Innovation Sprint methodology and how it can help business and businesses. Some of those tools will be available for participants today, so, but please note there are limited numbers. Ultimately, Andrew will challenge us and share ideas and practical tools to help us all get thinking and innovating. Our second session today is meeting client objectives using diversified portfolios. In a world where investment markets are continually changing, many participants are challenged in balancing the realities of investment outcomes and their clients' objectives. Join Beta Share and Morningstar as they discuss the various paradigms that advisors should consider when balancing the need for capital growth, capital stability, income, and the mitigation of risk. They'll also discuss various approaches to objective-based portfolio construction and take a deep dive into an approach that makes use of fixed income assets. After morning tea, we'll be joined in a discussion on taking a longer term perspective. Kelly Power of Colonial First State will share her perspectives that have led product design and delivery capabilities for some of the largest platforms in the industry. Kelly will make observations on the evol evolution of di different business models and how they work together. And the discussion will also cover challenges and drivers behind platform innovation and, and design, how larger platforms think about long term development and innovation and how platforms will support advice businesses in the future. That session will be followed up by a panel discussion directed by Bianca de Mello of Macquarie that centres on the role of the licensee in a post-Royal Commission world. There's been significant discussion on different business models for operating a licensee and its application post Hain Royal Commission. The panel will discuss the implications and opportunities arising from the Royal Commission with dealer principles and how they see their role and businesses survive and thrive in a post-Royal Commission world. The panel will also discuss the implications of the removal of the grandfather remuneration on their businesses and other licensees, and the value proposition that dealer licensees will bring to bear post the removal of grandfather remuneration. 
Can you still run your portfolios as a managed account? Well, the answer is yes, as Mason Stevens and Premium will discuss. Taking on the responsibility for managing client portfolios is a significant one. The ability to manage asset allocation and investment choices are just part of what's required to successfully scale a managed account business, so it's important to understand what it takes to make it part of your business. The panel will also discuss the requirements in terms of resources, approach, investment competence that would be required of a dealer group licensee if they want to run their own managed accounts, and the governance rules that do apply. We'll then adjourn for lunch and will be followed by a discussion on life outside the mainstream, other operating models. Now, as we know, the industry is dominated by the major players, whether they are banks or large licensees. And whilst there's been a swelling number of independently owned small licensees in recent years, the question is what other business models are out there? Join Philo and Explore Wealth as they discuss operating models outside the mainstream. They'll discuss those benefits, what are the challenges, and how is it possible to transition? I'll then take the reins and moderate a panel session with Stanford Brown and Ironbark in a discussion on how value is generated from a business. Without a, without a doubt, the most sensitive of issues that's been raised by recent events has been the fees charged to clients and the remuneration attached to those fees in businesses in advice. Our panel will discuss what services are being provided. Are they still relevant? What do clients value versus what they pay for? the inherent conflict of interest in offering managed accounts and how it could be managed. And what might ongoing service be in a post-Royal Commission world? We'll close out the day's session with one that everyone should listen to and absorb. Best interest duty, how to manage accounts fit. As you expect, it will cover broader perspectives than just those applying to managed accounts. But we'll talk to best interest duty as it applies to advisors, can managed accounts comply, and in that discussion, we'll be joined by Greg Newman of Hub24 and Simon Caritas of The Fold Legal. And they'll make observations in seeing people either comply or fall foul of best interest duty in the offering of managed accounts. Interpreting the law when offering managed account product and how advice businesses might comply. With the conclusion of that session, we'll finish the day with drinks that are expected to start around five. We we'll look forward to you joining us for those. The Wi-Fi details for those who are interested are attached to your lanyard. Toilets are out the door to the left and then first right, keep walking. And should an emergency arise, despite what Toby told me before the conference, I'm not an honorary fire warden. We do need to follow the staff's instructions. IMAP has also made a conscious decision to protect our environment, so all presentations will be available for download via scanning on the QR code in your lanyard. Now, I was going to say, ask the youngest person on your table, but as of two days ago, I now know how to use one. Scan a QR app or download a QR app into your, into your phone, scan it, and it'll call up the actual website that has all the presentations in it. So without further ado, let's kick off our first session of the day, innovation, why it's more important than ever. And I'd like to welcome Andrew Bourne of Net Wealth to the stage. Andrew is Head of Marketing of Net Wealth. He's overseen the function of net wealth, working closely and reporting to the Joint Managing Director. Marketing's responsible for brand, lead generation, retention and sales support. Andrew has over 15 years working with digital technologies as a technician, strategist and marketer. He focuses on how the internet and technologies influence relationships and how we do business. He studied law, commerce, accounting, economics and intellectual property. So join me in welcoming Andrew to the stage. Thanks, Rick, and thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I, um, I just want to um, take you back to 2001, once I get the slides going. And 2001, the dot-com bubble had just burst. 9-11 had just passed, and I'd finished three years running a startup in Los Angeles and was looking for my new challenge. I came back to Australia. And I got a job as a project lead for Yellow Pages, um, working at Census. Now, Census, as you probably recall, or do recall, had a number of iconic brands, including Yellow Pages, but also the White Pages. At that time, it, was t it had revenue of $1 billion a year. Imagine that. $1 billion in advertising revenue coming from people like maintenance people, pet control people, and plumbers. 
I was tasked to project lead a CEO endorsed project. It was one of six. And the role of the, 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 the project was to take yellow pages beyond a business directory and into something um, more content driven. So if you were going to look for a tiler, you wouldn't just be able to get a name of tilers, but you'd also get information about what tiles you could choose from, what grout you could choose. So the idea behind this project was to expand the yellow pages. Now, it had everything and all the resources you'd expect. It had a cross-functional team that included lawyers and IT people and, and product people like myself. It had um, used uh, methodologies like Six Sigma and Voice of the Customer. It did lots of research, but unfortunately the project failed. Before I go into that, at the time, Census had an opportunity to buy or invest in realestate.com, but it didn't. It had the opportunity to invest in carsales.com, but it didn't. And you bet it, you guessed. It had the opportunity to invest in Seek, but it didn't. Instead, it invested in Trading Post. Now, at the time, it made sense. eBay was very popular, and Trading Post was the print version of eBay, so why wouldn't you do that? In my humble opinion, and this is not a slur on census at all, it's very difficult for large incumbents to innovate. But the reason I believe they innovated wasn't a lack of smart people, it wasn't a lack of good ideas, it was a lack of strong leadership, and it was a lack of willingness to trial and error, to actually have grit and determination and stand by some of those ideas. So what I want to share with you today um, no, before I do that, the, the other the interesting part was I jumped from job to job um, and at Census. I had a number of different projects. I actually led the, the, the launch of the, the Yellow Pages app. And, and funnily enough, my title before leaving was Head of Innovation at Yellow. So the irony in that was quite interesting. The, what I learnt though, and working at companies like Census and a number of startups and, and, and fortunately today at NetWealth, is that innovation, um, although is very possible, is difficult. It takes a lot of curiosity. You need to challenge the status quo. It's, it's not easy. But what I want to share with you today are some case studies and some tools that are hopefully you can take into your business to help you innovate. The first myth I want to bust is that, uh, that innovation needs to be the shiny new technology toy or it needs to disrupt a market. That's not the case. Innovations can be small tweaks to your business that can deliver great outcomes. Take McDonald's, for example. In 1974, they put a hole in the wall. That's not technology. Today, in the US alone, it represents 60% of all of their revenue, the drive-through. So for me, think about innovation not just being technology, it's important. In 1982, Sony released the first CD player. The computer was Time's man of the year or person of the year. And Jane Fonda had just sold her millionth video about exercising. The health craze was really kicking off then. For two years, Diet Coke had been working behind the scenes to build their first new brand and launch their new brand into the market, Diet Coke. Now, Diet Coke, as we know, was wildly successful. And one of the learnings there was they followed a trend. They understood that the health market was about to kick off and they built a product around it. Think about building their first brand in 96 years. Pepsi, the challenger brand, known for its innovation, didn't have an answer. And it took them a number of years to really understand the market and see what was happening. What they did realise, though, was Diet Coke wasn't cool for guys. Women loved it, but guys didn't like it. And I'm not sure what that's got to do with the white can, but ultimately they realised that to launch a challenger brand, they would have to focus on another trend, another insight, and that was largely focusing on guys. 
So I don't know if you remember the, the, when Pepsi Max launched. It was live life to the max. It had guys doing extreme stunts, jumping off Mount Everest, surfing crazy waves. Um, and again, the point I'm trying to make here is innovation is about following trends. It's about listening to the customers. For the foodies in the room, you probably have heard of Asterio Francescano. It's a restaurant in Moderna, Ital Italy, and it's known for challenging traditional Italian cuisine. Chef Buturo always tries to challenge his staff, and he was driving to work one day, listening to Lou Reed. He walked into the, the, the restaurant and said to the guys, guys, new challenge today. Lou Reed, walk on the wild side. Make a dish. And his staff looked at him. What am I supposed to do? But through trial and thinking through it, they built, they, they created dishes based on the baseline. They created dishes based on the era. They created dishes based on the song, the, the, the words of the song. Now, what does that mean for business? Well, asking and challenging your staff, creating interesting, non-predictable questions and challenging them can gr create great results. I just hope he doesn't challenge his staff with the other famous Lou Reed song, Heroin. You're, many people in this room are probably like me. You might have a huge CD library. I know I did. I had hundreds and hundreds of CDs. And, and don't ask me what genre I listen to. You, you probably won't like it. But I, um, be, I'm an early adopter. But MP3s and the Apple iPod scared the hell out of me. I wasn't going to waste this whole, a lot of money I spent on, on this device, which was awesome. You know, walking around with thousands of songs, who doesn't want to do that? Anyway, I was one of the last people to get an Apple iPhone, uh, Apple iPod. Um, Amazon recognised this. So they, they, they had a, a huge CD business selling physical CDs um, to lots and lots of people. And what they realised was they weren't selling as many MP3s as they could, or they should. What they did was disrupt themselves. For every CD that was purchased on Amazon, they gave their client or that customer a free MP3 for that. So you can all have imagined people who spent lots of money on CDs then all of a sudden then had an MP3 library. That removed friction from the process of buying MP3s. It also disrupted itself. Imagine if Yellow Pages had taken that approach. Amazon, the biggest company retailer in the world, arguably, disrupted its physical CD business by selling MP3s. It didn't know the outcome. At the time, Apple had iTunes and was killing the market. So the message there is not just innovation removes friction, but disrupt yourself. Van Phillips had a, had a, was, was water skiing one day and lost his leg. And he was encouraged, like most amputees, to wear a very uncomfortable, um, clumsy, clunky leg. Um, he was determined, however, to run again, to jump again, and spent a lifetime researching different types of um, prosthetics. He took knowledge from outside his, biz outside his knowledge area and created the C-shaped leg. And what's fascinating about this story is that it's based off the hind of a cheetah. The message here is you can learn so much from outside in. How much can you learn from other industries similar to you, from architects, from engineers, from doctors, from lawyers? There's so much you can learn from these different businesses. You can learn things from your partners, your technology partners. So I encourage you to think outside in. Before I go through my next example, I just want to play a short video. Ladies, it's time to shut a few things down. The wage gap, thigh gap, the investment gap. Don't know that one? It's that thing where women aren't getting their fair share because the investment industry and almost all its tools are built for men by men. Yeah, that's a thing. 
It means even if you're doing everything right, planning for the future, saving for what matters, kicking butt and getting yours, you're still getting less because the system isn't built for the realities of being you. Realities like you live longer, your salary may peak sooner, and things like career breaks, smaller raises, and the fact that your financial advisor has an 86% chance of looking like this could cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars or more over your lifespan. Enough. We are on a mission to fix it. We are Elevest, the first investment platform designed to help this half of the population meet their financial goals. It's built for women, designed by women. That means we get ours, for real this time. Financial independence, financial equality, financial power. Because being in control of our money is power. What will you do with yours? Elevest, invest like a woman. In 2002, Sally Krawcheck was arguably the most powerful woman on Wall Street. She had just taken a role at Smith Barney's, Citibank's new wealth division. And in that year, she was named in Time's top global influencers and in Fortune's top, top people under, um, under 40. 15 years on, uh, she decided to build the LFS platform. And the LFS platform, as you can see, is targeting women. But what's really interesting about this and what's innovative about this is her approach. She spent lots and lots of time and she claims thousands of coffees with women trying to understand their financial needs. She, was, she designed this platform to, 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 to reduce the investment gap. And, and one of the really interesting findings is on this slide. Gentlemen put money at num well, number one whilst women make it number four. Meaning and purpose are number one for women. Now, we're building an online robo-platform and having that as an insight. What, what does that then look like? Well, the first thing it looks like is that women value objectives. They want to save money, invest money for things such as kids are awesome. I want to save my kids' future. I want to start my own business. So the Elevest online platform has about 10 objectives, which gets women to prioritise them in particular order. The investment portfolios it then builds is based on some of those objectives. Another really important insight it had was that women don't invest to beat the market. Women invest to secure their financial futures. Women are much more interested in security than winning. And as such, the language that they use through the website, the portfolios that they use through the robo tool reflect that. The other insight, which most of you in this room will know, and, and quite obvious, is that women's earning capacity in general, not for everyone, uh, peaks a lot earlier due to, to, due, due to numerous things, but they, all, they live longer. Another really interesting fact was that women are very interested in investing in social responsibility organisations and funds, and are also interested in investing in businesses that um, support gender equality. And you can see on the screen there, they've got a number of investment funds that are part, for part of the robo portfolio. One of the really other fascinating th insights that they found, and this is how they charge, is that women are much more price elastic than guys. Guys are always looking for the lowest price point. And in fact, the industry in America is very much about the lowest price. But through this process and through understanding customers, they realised that they could actually charge double to women. It's a 50 basis point charge for this, this product compared to 25 basis point, which is the average for some of these online tools. So <clears throat> why, why am I sharing these examples? And I must admit, I could, I could talk all day about examples in innovation. Uh, there, there's so many good examples around. And if you, if you pick up magazines like Fast Company or the HBR or Wide, you, you, you'll get these all the time. But, the reason I'm sharing this with you, it demonstrates different things about innovation. It's about curiosity. It's about leadership. It's about thinking outside the square and getting people um, from other parts of the organisation or other disciplines. Sakachi Toyota was the founder of Toyota. Um, obviously, pretty famous guy. But one of the really interesting things about, about Sakachi was he was, very, he was a philosopher as well. And he brought the notion to his business of, of many different things, including lean manufacturing principles and things like that. But one of the things that he was very famous for was the five whys. 
And the five whys is basically ask, if you've got any problem, ask why five times. And you'll get to the root of the problem. Now, it's like a kid. I don't know who's got kids in the room, but like they just ask questions. Why? 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 So my question to you is, why can't we all be like kids? I'm going to share with you now some tools which I think can be used in your business. What I also wanted to remind you is innovation's hard. So some of these tools may make it a bit easier to kickstart innovation. The first tool that um, we have used a number of times with advisors is called a customer journey map. Now, a customer journey map basically looks at the advice process through prospecting to periodic reviews, but it puts yourselves in the, in the position of a customer. You put yourselves in the shoes of your customer, you feel empathy with a customer, you understand what we call their pain points, their friction points. They're points where there might be some anxiety. So for example, they've jumped on your website on their phone, but it's not responsive. I can't read anything, or I can't find the information I need. That's a pain point. They come into your office for a fact find, and you ask them all these questions, and they're going, I don't know the answer, or I can't find the information, or some of these questions make me a bit nauseous to respond to, um, that's a pain point. Um, and the SOA being difficult to understand, that's a pain point. Through this exercise of understanding pain points, you can then innovate against. And that's what part B of the customer journey workshop's about. We, we use these things like innovation cards, and, and these are available from, from our stand. And these are really stimulus to help you drive outside in thinking. Questions like, if advice was completely visual, how would you, how would you do that? Um, if it was easy as ABC, um, if we gave this away for free, if millennials ruled the world. A lot of these cards or these tools are just there to thought provoke, to act as stimulus. So we recently worked with uh, uh, an advice firm in Brisbane and they, through their process, came across 30 pain points, um, such as, you know, the SOA is too much jargon. I mean, obviously people have that notion in their room. Um, what do I do when I get that? And also they looked at things like, hey, I've got, um, if something changes, who do I call? They came up with some cool innovations using our innovation templates, such as um, the automated executive summary to the, the online, uh, to, to the um, statement of advice. This was automatically generated by an online tool which had natural language processing and a whole lot of AI. Now, it sounds pretty cool, but what they also did was they investigated how to do this. They said they need a data scientist, they need to work with technology partners. So innovation is not just about a cool idea, it's also about how do you execute. We were fortunate enough to work with Swinburne University and design, design um, studio Mass and 40 honours students. And we challenged those honours students to answer the problem, how do you get Australians more engaged with their super and investments? It was a cross-functional group of IT students, marketing students and comm students. And I just want to show you a quick video of, of that program. Creative Director and Founder of Mass. I have a real interest personally in uh, kind of deconstructing the design process and, and I've found that uh, this design sprint methodology really liberates designers to think laterally and to think about um, how they can collaborate and essentially kind of question what, what it is to be a designer. The reason that Wealth got involved was to support our purpose and our vision, which is to help Australians and enable Australians to see wealth differently. And by working with university students, we we're able to create new possibilities, all in the area of wealth, superannuation, investments, financial literacy, financial wellbeing. The design sprint process is really interesting. I have been aware of it, but not 
over such a short period of time. It gives you a, a really logical way of getting people working cohesively together. It's very understandable. So my motivation with this was to be able to get students to work on a real world problem but also learn a new method in the process. So right now with the sort of like um, idea generation process, so we're throwing ideas around and um, we've sort of found like three good ideas and we're sort of putting it all together. So we're joining it and we're sort of like building on top of that. I think everyone's been really good at like um, listening to what everyone else has to say and kind of giving everyone a chance to talk and so that's been really positive. We'd never met these people before in most cases, uh, but it was really good, you know, start with a bit of a chat and yeah, then you just go around and see what people want to get out of it, uh, what they'd like to bring to it and particularly what they would like to bring to this field because the goal of this is to help people engage with their superannuation and their finances in general. So my idea is about the interpretation of um, making financial planning and investment in in this kind of like ticking off the list and I interpret it in terms of like you're flagging on top of the mountain, like you accomplished on top of the mountain so throughout your lives so you have several mountains of goals to, to flag or accomplish it. So what I tried to do is make something that would, rather than telling you what you might already know, it actively tries to help you organise and find things opportunities that you weren't previously aware of. So it's divided on your profile into four different sections uh, and it's called Hustler. Um, and as a result it is less financial advisor and more like a financial good man. Sorry about the, the lip sync there. Um, the, the design sprint is five days. Um, now not everyone has the luxury to spend five days innovating but some of the things that are really relevant th things that you can take out of such a program is first of all again we had a, we had people in the room who actually didn't have a clue about investments and super they come up with some amazing ideas which I'm going to share with you in a second um, and, and, and not only that I encourage you to go and grab one of these books um, which has all of the ideas um, and so that was one of the really interesting things about it the other really interesting part about a design sprint is that we get to prototype and i'm going to talk a bit about that later but prototyping is the ability to test something in real with your customers so one of the really cool insights that the guys found was that um, young australians will engage with their money and save better if it's through gamification and visualization uh, so this app here was called uh, was was basically the ability to um, set short-term objectives and long-term objectives, and a mountain range would appear based on those objectives. And as you were saving more and more money, you would climb that mountain. And when you achieved that goal, you'd get a flag. So you actually had a had some type of objective, and it was actually that visualization which was as much spurring a person on as anything. Another visualisation was um, Money Mish, where you had short missions. Every week you had a mission and you had to save more money for that period of time. And it used data such as a holiday or a, a, a plane to actually show you your progress. Another one that I really liked was using a plant metaphor uh, um, as a savings tool. So like growing a plant, you're, you're saving and you're growing money. Um, one of the other cool um, innovations we saw was education. So the insight there was, you know, young Australians don't have much of a clue about um, superannuation. And not only that, they don't have the resources uh, to, to find out about superannuation. So the idea there was to, when a person got their superannuation statement for the first time or a letter for the first time, they'd have a QR code or a barcode at the bottom, which they'd just scan, and all of a sudden this chatbot would start um, interacting with it and the chatbot would be in natural language, conversational, it'll have emojis, it'll have imagery like Pulp Fiction and grandfathers shaking money but it would be very much around engagement and again it would ask them questions, do you want to learn more, yes or no and take them on that journey. As I mentioned before prototyping is a big part of innovation. Now people probably think prototyping is just scary and costs lots of money. But it doesn't have to be. Keep in mind these children, these children, these young adults had only a day. Um, and children to me. Um, <laughs> and one of the cool ideas that they came up with is this virtual um, touch screen, which was basically designed to mimic and, and educate people of what the financial advice process was. So what they wanted to do was they had six screens 
um, which would be a pop-up installation in, in a university or a place where kids hang out like shopping malls. And these were big touch screens which would ask fact find style questions like what are your financial objectives and what's your lifestyle. But instead of responding via a keyboard or even talking, they used emojis to answer that. So if I was going on, if my, one of my objectives was a holiday, I'd, I'd use a surfboard or, or I'd use, you know, uh, skis and that would be how I would interact with this. So it was a fun and engaging way of interacting. Now, how do you build that in a day? You don't have big touch screens, you don't have tech skills. So what they did was they did these big A3 posters. They dipped out about 50 emojis and blue tack, put them all on the wall and they got people, they got about eight people to go through the process. And at the end, they sat that person down and they asked a whole lot of questions. They did that eight times and they got some great insights, you know, whether people learnt from this experience, whether they'd use this type of thing. So IDEO is a company, one of the most innovative companies in the world. They actually invested in, invented the Apple mouse. And how they prototype is again very simple. They were approached by a company to create a, a Fitbit or a wearable for females. The thing they wanted to learn was what was the tone, what was the, how would the device interact with females. So what did they do? They gave a, a group of females in their, in their gym um, suits um, a phone. They had an IDEO person texting that person back and forward. It was as simple as that. It was a text message. Now, one of the insights they found from that experience was that women were just as interested in the journey as the outcome. And they wanted to share their frustrations with the journey. So they would be typing back, you know, I can't get there and, you know, this is too hard. So it was very much about the journey. One, one of the funny insights, which I quite like, is that one lady actually called the Fitbit a he in their frustration. So how does that mean, what, what does that mean for yourselves? What, what's, a, what's, a, what's a practical example for you in prototyping? Well, according to, to the 2018 Advice Tech survey that NetWealth ran last year, only 33% of advisors use an online fact find. Now I find that amazing, considering that people today are happy to put their credit cards online, they're happy to take photos of their credit cards, they upload them to um, Uber, to Airbnb, why can't they give you details online? Well, they can. And I want to show you with the tools like Typeform or SurveyMonkey, you can create your own online fact find. Now in this example, this is actually a template that you can download and you can actually see it's already pre-populated with tons of demographic style questions. Why don't you build your own online fact find using a tool like this? can be simple at first. You can then, when the prospect comes in for their meeting, you can then ask them, how did you find that process? What have you answered more questions? So forth. You've built a prototype and tested it. And that probably has only taken a day or two. So I want to leave you with this. Innovation is hard. I'm acknowledging that and I don't believe it's easy. But innovation is possible. Um, firstly, it takes strong leadership. I don't want people to be thinking they need to be like yellow pages. Um, it takes a team of being curious. Now, some people in this room are not naturally curious, but I'm sure you've got staff in your team that are. Get them involved in innovation. Listen and observe to your customers. Listen and observe your customers. Find insights, how they behave. Using tools like our, path, uh, our customer journey workshops really, really helps you empathise with them and put, them in, put yourselves in their shoes. Bring new knowledge in. Innovation doesn't have to be a new business model. We all talk about new business models and disrupting the industry, but we can just put a hole in our wall and we can be very successful. And innovation is about trial and error, testing and learning. If you don't show grit and determination, you won't learn. So fake it and learn from that. It's not difficult. And finally, there are available tools around. NetWealth's developed a whole ton of them um, and they're available from our website. They're available on our stand. Um, we have the innovation cards. We've got customer journey workshops. Um, we run customer journey workshops with, with, with a number of advice practices. So thank you very much for your time today. And hopefully I haven't been too preachy and um, you've sort of got a feel for what um, one of my passions is. Thank you.
definitely not preachy, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, key points, I mean, innovation doesn't have to be technology. You know, disrupt yourself and the value of prototyping. It can be simple, just listen. So let's move on to our next session, uh, meeting client objectives with diversified portfolios. I'm gonna introduce Robert Tolevsky of Activist Advice. Um, Rob, let me find his bio. Um, in addition to his responsibilities of servicing activist clients, Rob is also responsible for a range of investment activities, which include asset allocation strategy, investment management recommendations, and portfolio construction process. Robert is an accomplished investment executive with over 20 years experience in investment management and advisory activities, large Australian super funds and institutional teams. So please join me in welcoming Robert. Thanks, Rick. Um, it is my pleasure to be the moderator of today's panel discussion on meeting client objectives using diversified portfolios. This is a discussion uh, on finding the opportunities and the optimal balance between capital stability, income generation, and diversification of risks through a fixed income approach. A topic of particular interest to those of us who are currently, or you know, on an ongoing basis, um, uh, putting together portfolios for our clients. We have two with us two well-credentialed individuals. Peter Harper is responsible for educating and assisting investors to achieve best execution and liquidity in BetaShares exchange-traded funds. Prior to BetaShares, Peter worked in equities and derivatives roles with Macquarie Bank and ABN AMRO. Peter has also uh, held roles in institutional corporate FX sales with ABN AMRO and fixed income with UBS. Brad Bug is responsible for the multi-asset SMA portfolios at Morningstar. Since 2009, he's played a, reading, a leading role in developing and evolving the Morningstar managed account portfolios. He leads, uh, he leads research on key issues and developments associated with investing in Asia Pacific fixed income markets for the global investment management team. His committee participation includes Asia Pacific Investment Policy, Global Best Practice Groups, Asset Allocation, Manager and Security Selection and Portfolio Construction. Peter and Brad will discuss the various paradigms that advisors should consider when balancing the need for capital growth, capital stability, income and mitigating risks. In terms of the format of this, of this session, Peter and Brad will conduct a 10 minute presentation and this will be followed by a panel discussion and followed by the opportunity for questions by the audience. Over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Rob, and um, thank you everyone for coming along today. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you. I think we'll just uh, wait for the slides to come up, which should be any minutes. <laughs> and it looks very nice. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. All right. So, uh, as always, um, just the uh, obligatory disclaimer: um, everything we talk about today is uh, general in uh, in nature and doesn't take into account anyone's specific circumstances. Um, Look, I think it's fairly well acknowledged in markets that their uh, um, asset allocation is what predominantly drives um, the majority of alpha in client portfolios. And when we look at asset allocation, um, in our mind, there are three key sources of excess return in um, asset allocation. The first is obviously equity exposure. But the other two are duration and credit. And those two sources of excess return, when combined in various blends, are what makes up fixed income. And so looking at how you can blend duration and credit is what we're going to look at today in terms of trying to get the best outcomes um, and, and alter portfolio outcomes for investors. 
Generally, there are three key reasons why investors invest in fixed income. The first is diversification um, away from other asset class risks such as equities. The second is for a regular and reliable income stream. And the third is for preservation of capital. Now, which of these is the most important um, to any individual client will vary from client to client. And as a result, in our mind, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. When we look at traditional passive benchmarks, as one example, perhaps the Osborne Composite Index, they were originally designed not as investable vehicles, but rather just a measure of the fixed income landscape in Australia. As a result, they incorporate what we view to be some inherent um, challenges in their construction, generally. So the first is obviously um, liability weighting. So to us, it doesn't make sense to give more to an issuer who is more indebted and less to an issuer who is less indebted. Secondly, they offer very unstable risk profiles. Who in the room is familiar with the terms duration creep or segment creep? Okay, not too many hands, I'll, I'll explain that one. So duration creep is, is where the duration um, of your fixed income exposure varies over time. So to give you an example, the nature of the Osborne Composite Index has varied significantly from 2006 to 2019, and we'll have a look in just a sec. That's resulted in the duration of the Osborne Composite Index rising from three and a half years, or thereabouts, up to about just shy of five and a half years of duration. So if you just held Osborne Composite over that period, your exposure to duration, which is the key diversification element of fixed income, has changed dramatically without you doing anything over that period of time. Secondly, when we talk about segment creep, that looks at the breakdown of the components of an index such as Osborne Composite. Um, we'll have a look at that uh, now. If we look at the breakup of um, Osborne Composite back in 2006, in yellow you've got supranationals, which made up about 12% of the Osborne Composite. That stayed fairly stable from then through to now. Grey is corporate bonds, and they used to be 35% of the Osborne Composite Index. They've now declined to 12%. And orange is state government, um, blue federal government. I'm going to combine those two together and just talk about general government exposure. So back in 2006, government exposure made up about 53% of the Osborne Composite Index. Now that is up as high as 76% of that index. And what's driven that? Well, quite simply, federal government deficits and, and the um, uh, funding needs of the federal government. As they've issued more bonds to fund that deficit, those bonds are very large in the market and therefore form a larger part of the Osborne Composite Index. So to us, it seems perverse to tie the investment outcomes of your clients to what has primarily been driven by the issuance requirements of the federal government. It doesn't seem a very efficient way to build portfolios for, for MDA model portfolio constructors. Additionally, government exposures offer little to no pickup over cash, as you're probably well aware. The final factor here is that for an MDA model portfolio constructor, which many of you obviously are, if you can't predict the outcomes of an index, how do you predict outcomes for your clients holding that exposure? So the changes to indexes through duration creep and segment creep offer real challenges for portfolio constructors in our view. So is the solution to go active? Well, um, certainly, BetaShares uh, you know, does offer an active bond fund, BNDS, in conjunction with Leg Mason Western Asset. Um, and they are one of the very few active managers who've demonstrated a long-run track record of uh, alpha over, uh, over and above fees. But for most fixed income active managers, it's been a pretty challenging time over a long period of time. So last year, we saw 98% of active fixed income managers underperform their benchmark. Over five years, that number is 90%. Additionally, if you look into the portfolios of many active managers in the fixed income space, they tend to be overweight credit and underweight duration. Why is that? Because underweighting duration reduces your volatility, which makes your sharp ratio shoot up. You then lose return, which you have to get back by overweighting credit. Now, when you reduce duration and increase credit exposure, 
what you tend to do is um, lose your diversification benefits away from equities. So we would argue that in most cases, fixed income active management has not had a good track record of providing the outcomes that investors are looking for. We think a more sensible approach is to deconstruct the various components of credit and duration and to put them to back together um, using individual tools that help you and your clients best meet objectives. So for an MDA model portfolio provider, it allows you to better meet the specific risk and uh, return requirements of your, your client base and your portfolio objectives. It also provides more um, predictable outcomes. You have a much more stable duration profile. You have a much more stable um, credit exposure, which helps you predict what your outcome is going to be into the future. You can avoid inefficiencies of being overweight um, government exposure that doesn't pay much over cash. So just as a quick example, if we were to take a long duration senior corporate bond exposure, um, such as CRED, um, and blend that with uh, a, a short, um, shorter, well, shorter duration floating rate bond exposure like coupon, um, in a 90% CRED, 10% coupon blend, that blend is going to come out with about the same duration as Osbond Composite. So you're going to end up with a very similar level of equity risk diversification to Osbond Composite. But you're going to increase your yield to maturity by about 136 basis points per annum. To us, deconstructing that index and putting it back together using more stable, predictable um, components creates a much better portfolio outcome for investors. I'll skip over that one. I think we've largely covered those points. So when combined with equities in a portfolio, long duration credit has actually provided both higher returns and less volatility at a portfolio level than just using an index like Osborne Composite. Let's have a look at those various components of fixed income and how they um, correlate to each other. What you'll see down the bottom is equities and duration are negatively correlated. So it's that, ne it's that duration in the fixed income portfolio that provides the diversification away from equity risk. If you're just holding a fixed income portfolio that is overweight credit, well, we see credit is positively correlated with equities. So when your equities sell off in that circumstance, you would expect your fixed income exposure to sell off at the same time if you're overweight credit. So having duration is important for diversification. Having credit helps boost some of your return. Now, one really interesting thing from an asset allocation point of view is something like a long duration corporate bond has the duration element to provide diversification. It has credit to provide some pickup in your return over the long run. But duration and credit are also negatively correlated, as, as you can see up the top of that chart there. So when you have two sources of risk or return premia that are negatively correlated to each other, it creates a beautiful asset allocation outcome for investors. Just as a quick example of this, if we look back to the Italian bond crisis of about May 2018, we saw a really heavy sell-off in equities um, throughout that period. Over that same period of time, you know, one of the stalwarts of um, active bond investing, um, Bill Gross, his portfolio sold off 3% in a day, which is a massive move at a time when equities are going down. Why did that portfolio sell off as a fixed income exposure when equities were, were, were declining? Well, because he was overweight credit and underweight duration. Just finally, I'd, uh, I'd like to make the point that Investors will choose whether they want to go active or passive at the end of the day, but do not mistake that the, I suppose that the passive um, means lower return. It most certainly does not. So if we look at a long duration corporate bond exposure, such as the index that um, uh, CRED, the CRED ETF tracks, it's beaten every active fixed income manager in Australia um, by an average of one point, or sorry, by beaten the best manager in Australia by 1.39% per annum over the last five years, um, net of fees and at an MER of just 25 basis points. So going passive does not mean giving up performance historically. So my final point I'd just like to re-emphasise is that as MDA model portfolio constructors, 
you now have the tools available in the market to achieve more efficient outcomes than just a broad-based traditional index such as Osborne Composite. You have the tools to create more predictable um, client and portfolio outcomes than can be provided by something like Osborne Composite. And you also um, have the ability to achieve outcomes that are more tailored to your client needs than historical benchmarks. Um, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I want to take a slightly different approach to sort of um, constructing sort of multi-asset portfolios. And when I was thinking about sort of today's topic, um, the first sort of question which really sort of leapt out at me, sort of what are the client objectives which we are, are, are trying to achieve in, in, in building a, a multi-asset portfolio? And when giving it some thought, um, I unfortunately came to the conclusion that there is no single magic number which sort of an investor can target in order to achieve their investment objectives. You know, everyone in this room has you know, different perspectives, they have different circumstances, and they have different investment horizons. And all those three factors will ultimately mean that sort of the end investment objective you're, you're trying to hit is going to be quite different from, from someone else. So what I thought I'd do today, rather than talk about you know, achieving that magic number, is some of the considerations we think about when we're trying to hit a particular uh, investment objective which, which is set for us. So I thought I'd start off by you know, looking back through time and sort of seeing how sort of the key building blocks which we bring together in a, a typical multi-asset portfolio have, have performed. And what we have on this chart here is 20 years of history of the key building blocks and how the returns they've delivered and the rank in which they've been delivered. I think there's two very important takeaways which, which, which come from it. First of all, that there's no one asset class which consistently will give you that magic number. You can see that the numbers are very volatile and the relativities of those numbers are also very different. So I think sort of constraining yourself to a single asset class makes it very difficult to achieve that you know, investment objective that you're trying to hit. The next thing is that I I think sort of, you know, if you look at those numbers and the variability that you see, if you're able to blend those numbers together, then that's going to give you a much better chance of, of, of hitting that, that end, end objective. But I would say that sort of if you are having to constrain yourself to that single asset class, fixed income probably isn't a bad place to start. You know, there's lots of attributes about fixed income which, which I think are attractive. First of all, you get that regular contractual coupon payment which fixed income gives you. You also got you know, those capital preservation qualities and also diversification against other assets in, in the portfolio. So I think you know, that's a fantastic starting point to, to build your portfolio, but it's not something you want to constrain yourself to. Because I think if you look at sort of the most recent years, you can see that sort of while Australian fixed income was the best performing asset class in 2018 and gave you a 4.5% return, you know, that's great and sort of if you're trying to achieve a a four to five percent return on a consistent basis. But if you look in the prior years, the returns are well below uh, what you would need to hit, hit, hit sort of a, a four to five percent objective. So you know, I think our approach is making sure that we identify those assets which we think are going to give us the best reward for risk and building a portfolio around that. And typically sort of that leaves fixed income as the core base but we will sort of go to other asset classes in order to pick up yield, um, pick up additional return, particularly when sort of the fixed income asset class is looking particularly attractive. There's another element which I wanted to talk about in terms of consistency of outcome as well, because I think the consistency of returns is going to become more and more relevant, particularly for those investors in their, the later part of, of their invest, investing cycle. And the reason for that is that they're relying on these investment outcomes for their day-to-day -day living. So they don't want to see the types of variability that, you, that we see on some, some of these charts. They want to be building a portfolio which is going to give them a more consistent outcome uh, in, in terms of their return profile, particularly in terms of income. And that's where we sort of see significant risk for, for, for fixed income. And this is typically referred to, to reinvestment risk. So what, how I've tried to illustrate that 
is take a small selection of asset um, key asset classes which typically will go into your portfolio and then sort of look at how the yields of those asset classes have, have changed over time. Now there's two dates I've chosen here, um, where we are at today, but also um, going back to October 2011. And the reason I've chosen that date, because that is when the RBA started to engage on their easing cycle, and, and by that I mean started to reduce interest rates. And you can see that sort of, you know, back then sort of you were getting sort of 4.75% for cash, and getting, you know, slightly above that or around that number for, for, for other fixed income asset classes. And, you know, that was great in, in, in terms of achieving that 4 to 5%, which, which investors tell, you know, that, that's typically the, the number that they target. However, as the Reserve Bank has reduced rates, um, bond rates have also come down. And so that's meant that sort of the return that you're getting has, has almost, you know, it's more than halved. And if you're an investor who's relying on that, those return outcomes or those income outcomes, that means your disposable income's also halved. And that's pretty, pretty difficult to, 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 to tolerate. Uh, and so we think that sort of you can address that sort of reinvestment risk by going to other asset classes where we see yields being, one, more attractive, but also a little bit more consistent. I mean, across the board here, you've seen yields come down. But I think sort of for the, a number of those asset classes, it hasn't come down by as much. Clearly, when you're introducing equities to, to enhance yield in your portfolio, you're bringing risk into the portfolio. So we look to control that by identifying equity asset classes, which we think has more defensive qualities. And in, here we'd sort of think about listed property, global infrastructure, assets which are typically seen as more defensive in the context of equities. And by introducing them into a, a portfolio which is predominantly fixed income, it does allow you to soften some of, some, some of that key investment risk. So finally, I just wanted to sort of maybe bring all those thoughts to life. And how I've done that is by sort of you know, looking at uh, our, our key sort of diversified income managed account and how its positioning has changed over time and, and maybe talk to some of the changes that we've seen. And the first one I draw to um, is, is the change in cash that we've seen over, over the last three years. Three years ago, um, you, we, were we were just starting to see sort of the, the interest rate cycle start, start to move up. So interest rates were, were very, very low. We saw a real risk that sort of you, you could lose capital by investing in uh, bonds at that point in time. So we preferred to be in cash. But holding cash at that point in time meant that sort of we had a pretty low yield. So in order to bolster that yield, we looked across the different asset classes and we identified Australian listed property as an asset class which we could introduce to the portfolio, which would help us enhance yield, but also not bring too much downside risk to, to, to that portfolio. And so you can sort of see that you know, over the three year period, our Australian property exposure has moved down from about 13% to just over 1%. And that, those allocations have sort of been rotated into other asset classes where yields have started to become more attractive. So over the course of the last three years, we've seen US interest rates move, move significantly higher. So that means a better opportunity for, for, for the yield investor. Um, our Australian bond exposure has come down because back then sort of the Australian bonds looked a lot more attractive relative to US bonds. And so that, that attractiveness has, has changed. And so we've looked to rotate that. And I think sort of looking forward, we could reduce that Australian bond exposure even further. You know, the RBA is now sort of expected to reduce interest rates to 1% by, 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 by the end of this year. And sort of, you know, that, that's going to be a pretty unattractive prospect. So again, we'll be needing to identify new opportunities for, 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 the, for the portfolio. And so, you know, we, we would expect that to, to come down further. And, you know, typically when you see um, in, in interest rates coming down, better opportunities pre present themselves elsewhere. So, you know, that's what we'll be on the lookout for. Um, so I think sort of, you know, the, the, the key, key takeaways from this is that, you know, it's very difficult to achieve your investment objectives if you're confining your portfolio to, to just one asset class. And, you know, we would recommend that sort of, you know, retain sort of fixed income as a core building block for, for, for building your portfolios and, and delivering those long-term consistent outcomes but also be flexible enough to go into other asset classes when valuation opportunities present themselves. So with that, um, I'll leave it there and hand back to Rob.
Thanks, Brad. Um, we might move across to the panel discussion now, and um, we might even sort of go through in further detail some of the, the interesting topics that we discussed during those presentations. Um, one of, the, of his, as an asset consultant, um, active versus passive is always an interesting topic, and I'm sure as advisors as well, um, you know, um, it, it's always something that, you know, we get asked a lot about, you know, which one should we sort of select and why in certain, in most asset classes, including fixed income. And, um, and our experience is essentially, you know, we, we follow an evidence-based approach, uh, which means, you know, we need to see evidence that active managers have outperformed their benchmarks um, over a long period of time. And if not, then obviously um, the, the, the passive consideration is, is also quite um, an easy uh, thing to consider. Um, for, for the two of you, um, what, what's your view on that active versus passive um, discussion and, and, and sort of what, what, what are some of the things that you consider when selecting um, managers and Um, thanks very much, Rob. Um, look, I mean, at BetaShares, we've got both active and passive exposures. So, I mean, I think it's it's horses for courses. Um, but, you know, as, exactly as you said, people need to um, look at the track records. And, and in particular, I would often say, um, look at the underlying exposure. Like, there are certain areas where active management has a long-run track record of adding alpha. Um, you know, small cap managers have tended to outperform the index fairly consistently over a long period of time. But then, you know, just using one example, I put up that fixed income slide. Now, the, the track record of active management in fixed income is, is woeful. Um, so it, it's, it's, you can't make a, a definitive statement in my view. You need to look at it asset class by asset class and exposure by exposure and, and have an open mind to both. Right. Yeah, we, we'd agree with that. Um, you know, we, we take the view that sort of there, there is very little alpha after fees in, in the Australian fixed income market. So you know, we, we, we tend to um, you know, seek ETF exposures in, in, in that space. Um, the two sectors which we probably look to um, for, for, for active management is in relation to sort of international bonds. You know, we believe that's a very diverse market um, where you can exploit sort of different country exposures, um, different sector exposures. Um, the, and the other sector which we typically look to is, is offering sort of um, you know, good alpha is in sort of the alternative space. So you know, that's where we look to, to, to managers to you know, deliver that, 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 that sort of active um, alpha to, to, to the portfolios. And one of the observations I'd like to make as well, um, you know, if you look at the performance of the, um, the active uh, managers within a, a lot of these quant sort of screen sort of um, populations is you're finding that sort of dispersion between the top performing managers over a long term in that sort of fixed income bucket and then you're sort of finding this slide of other active managers so it's really becoming a challenge to um, to select the, the, the best of breed, I guess. Um, but it's also, I guess, our responsibility being, um, you know, asset consultants, and I'm sure, Brad, you agree as well that, you know, we need to be sort of, I guess, doing our job and, and you know, focusing on that. But at the same time, um, I think, um, you know, active, and there's, there's a role for active and, and passive in this particular uh, um, asset class. Um, the, the definition of fixed interest has evolved over the last 10 years. Um, you know, if we go back, the old textbook definition of what's in a fixed income portfolio is was quite simple. Um, and I think in the last so 10 years, we've seen certain industry super funds, uh, sports loving industry super funds, who um, particularly like adding a lot of spice to their fixed interest um, asset class, if I won't say too much about that. But um, just um, your, your sort of views, Peter and Brad, around the evolution of what's included and what's considered um, as fixed income in, as of today and some of the risks around it, um, if you could perhaps share your insight. So, I think sort of um, you, we're, we're in an environment where sort of, you know, people have been allowed to put labels on sort of different asset classes um, with, within their portfolios. So some people will, you know, taking the example of um, you know, property inv infrastructure, you know, they've identified them as defensive assets because they have different attributes to typical equities. 
And I think sort of, you know, what we really need as, as, as an industry um, is some guidance from, from the regulators in, in terms of you know, defining what sits in certain buckets. And sort of you, us as uh, sort of investors and advisors, you know, we, we can then sort of compare apples with apples because at the moment sort of you, some industry funds you, you, you look at, they say they're sort of in they have sort of a 70-30 uh, growth defensive mix, but when you sort of unpack that all, it sort of lo looks more like a 90-10 mix. And so, you know, that's very difficult when sort of you, you've got clients sort of looking at those types of outcomes versus something which is being more true to label. Uh, and so I think sort of, you know, guidance in that regard um, w w would be a great advantage for the industry. Um, look, the obvious one that jumps out at me is hybrid securities. Um, I mean, they are exactly what they say, a, a blend of equities and fixed income. And as we speak to um, uh, advisors and portfolio constructors in the market, um, you know, there's a, there's a number of those who, who say they are most definitely not a fixed income exposure. And I would say you shouldn't expect them to provide diversification away from equity risk. So in that sense, I'd, I'd probably agree with that. But then there are equally as many who, who do view it as a, a fixed income exposure because of its stable, um, consistent income profile, at least historically. So that, that argument um, to me is something that each investor has to form um, their own view on. It's not really for me to um, you know, state what's, what's right or wrong, or, or as Brad said, you know, for a regulator to, to, to clarify. Um, but I think for the majority of cases, um, you know, what is fixed income and what is not is fairly, fairly clear. Um, let's probably go across to questions from the audience. Are there any questions from the audience for our panel? Yes. I, I had a question for Brad um, sort of around the alternatives exposure. Uh, around the alternatives exposure. Um, what are alternatives to you um, and, you know, what sort of strategies are you implementing there? So the alternatives which we implement into our portfolios um, they're not typically re return seeking. They're, they're there to give us diversification to traditional equity and, 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 and bond markets. So the assets which sort of typically make um, their way into, into that allocation um, has been sort of some elements of, of, of global infrastructure. Um, it's not typically sort of a, a benchmark global infrastructure. It's more those regulated u u utilities that um, we're, we're looking to get exposure to. Um, we also have sort of um, Australian bank loans um, in, in, in that portfolio because we think the outcomes which you're getting um, from, from that asset class are, are quite different to, to, to what you get from traditional bond and equity markets. Um, and we also have some systematic strategies in there as well. Um, you know, we do think that there is manager alpha um, in, in the alternative space and, uh, and look to harvest that. Just picking up on the comments regarding um, hybrid securities, um, as we've seen from, from your pie chart up on the board, um, complexity of asset allocation has become much more evident where sub-asset classes are much more prevalent now, uh, subcategories of fixed income. We still try to shoehorn it into the old growth defensive definition, and I just wonder about your thoughts on that and how you go about advising advisors on this particular issue because it seems to me that uh, we try to persist with that simplicity um, in what is increasingly a complex approach to portfolio construction and then be surprised when portfolios deliver unexpected outcomes um, in different market environments that looking at it from a very simplistic growth defensive split you wouldn't necessarily anticipate. So I just wonder what your thoughts are there. How do you see that potentially evolving, if you see it evolving at all? I think in terms of the growth defensive um, split argument, it's really important to have as wide a range as, 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 as possible. Um, being constrained to a particular growth number or defensive number um, just, just creates problems. Um, in terms of our asset allocation, what we're trying to achieve is is build a portfolio of assets which we think are going to give us the best reward for risk at any point in time. So that could mean that sort of 
if we sort of have particularly expensive um, bond or equity markets, that you may sort of have a much higher income exposure than what sort of your target exposure might be. Uh, and similarly for, 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 for growth assets. So having that flexibility to be able to move your portfolio where you see the value at a point in time, rather than being constrained to a specific growth defensive mix is, is, is vital. And look, I'd, I'd just say it's, it's very, very challenging to answer this. And I think it has to come down to the client's situation and, and their view at the end of the day. I mean, look at um, the sell-off in, in global equities during a GFC and compare it to the sell-off in, in hybrid securities. And hybrids were off about a third to a half as much as equities. So in that sense, you know, if your client is happy saying, well, I only lost a third or a half as much as I would have if I'd been in equities, yeah, hybrids are defensive. Um, but if your client's not willing to tolerate a drawdown of um, 15 to 25% in a particular part of the portfolio, then they, they probably don't view hybrids as defensive and therefore shouldn't, shouldn't have them allocated to the defensive part of their portfolio. And sort of the way we look at it as well is around potential outcomes around those portfolio bands and you know, through stress testing and scenario analysis, it gives you a sense of, in addition to this is what your growth mix is, these are your potential outcomes out of those growth mixes, which you probably in part help answer that question. Um, thank you very much for your um, uh, for today, and I appreciate uh, Brad and, and Peter's um, presentations. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Robert. We'll uh, adjourn for morning tea. It is um, 25 past. We'll go for um, 15, so 22. You'll hear the bell when we get called back. And we'll be joined by Kelly Power of Colonial First Date. Thank you.